Um, two kind of related things, both in a, in a way infrastructural at two different levels. One, I just had a question about the badges, whether you've already considered um, a mechanism for cryptographic authentication. I thought so that a particular certifier you know, can say that this person really did receive this thing. And you know, if not, you should. And it's fairly simple to do at the technical level, but there's, you know, there should be a standard about how that's done. Um, but the second thing uh, was your respondent's uh, point about what I, I take broadly to be this problem of walled gardens, where you know community content is perhaps being co-opted in the Huffington Post case, and most certainly Facebook is a prominent walled garden <coughs> where you know contributed content becomes closed. But I also think of a bit older one. There's this very negative example of um, Internet Movie Database, which you know is a widely used site and started out purely as user content, but under these kind of sneaky guidelines where they could then ultimately close it all and you know proprietarize it. And I wonder from a like a charter point of view, I mean from a, a legal point of view, what you've done to make sure that there's no such threat in the future for your project. Um, yeah, I'd actually like to respond to that. Um, because I think there are some, so I was very happy, um, so obviously I liked the fact that Gary thinks we're great, but I, the, the, like I was really happy about your question because uh, for so, some are really questions that we're struggling with and it's good to kind of get more perspective on that. And, and sorry, this is just kind of a roundabout way to come back there. Um, but also because I think some of the uh, tension that you're feeling about P2P is more to do with our inability to articulate what exactly it is that we're doing. So, for example, the, the Facebook uh, comparison and the kind of capitalism that would work with P2P University. So it, it is absolutely impossible that any of P2P University's content will ever be closed off because uh, whatever is put on the site is licensed under uh, CC by SA. So every every user has the right to take everything and put it on their own own website. We, we have no control over what they do with it, uh, except that if they do uh, follow-on works, they also have to license them openly. So we're, we're not only giving everyone access to the materials, we're actually almost forcing them to reopen whatever they do with them as well. So it's uh, very difficult. So, well, so first of all, legally it's impossible to take the content and close it. Uh, secondly, we've um, set up, uh, we had a discussion about should we incorporate as a for-profit or non, not for-profit. We incorporated as a not-for-profit. Um, and I have to say, it, against my um, uh, preference, because it is so much work uh, to do it, um, but the reason why we ended up doing it is because two things. One is it's easier to cement a commitment to openness in the non-for-profit uh, structure. And secondly, the perception issues around for-profit where um, it's just, there's something like it could go the wrong way, you know. And Mozilla is a good example. They have a for-profit, <coughs> Firefox is a for-profit that makes a huge amount of money, but it is wholly owned by a not-for-profit that makes sure that they never do anything uh, like the Huffington Post deal with Firefox, right? So, um, so yeah, we, I mean, so we definitely, uh, so for me, openness is, I think, uh, uh, goes beyond uh, just having the content online and, and, and possibly building some business model into it. Um, yeah, did I, and the cryptographic thing, uh, so Mozilla is, is really on the technology side, Mozilla is leading the badge infrastructure development. They've decided against it so far. Uh, so the, the um, it basically a badge is just an XML blob, uh, JSON actually, but, um, and it says uh, who's the identity of the person that has it, who gave it, and what's the URL that, that provides some form of evidence. But then it's kind of up to you, up to the application developers to figure out ways to build authentication into this and, and you know, all of those trusted networks. Um, there isn't currently kind of a signing uh, of the of the actual tokens that get sent around. So the URL points to the, the certifier essentially. Exactly. The certifier yeah. Is free to publish a list of exactly. Uh, I've been trying to think about uh, some of the conceptual implications of the model. I was struck by your phrasing that we, in any 
decision, we always opt for experimentation over structure. And uh, it, it made me think of uh, Reinberger's experimental systems, <coughs> um, which comes out of the sciences, but which is a paradigm of a kind of future-oriented learning where um, uh, people are studying something of which the implications and the outcome are not quite known yet, so in the form of anticipatory knowledge. And in this concrete case, I see it also as a, as a new type of, of cyborg learning, uh, because I think we have to look at the agency of the web. Uh, it's almost like it's a, it's a the learning unit is the humans who use it plus the web, and they kind of co-evolve together in a direction that might not be totally clear yet. And um, my, my question in, in this sense is, um, what about unintended consequences? kind of blowback of the model, you know, the, the unintended um, effects. And some of them, I think, Bill uh, already voiced. Are there concerns about uh, how the model might be uh, appropriated for less benign <coughs> concerns or used uh, for more capitalist uh, profit-oriented uh, ways and all kinds of things. But also, for me, it's also questions about what we all call the per performativity of the classroom, the face-to-face, -face, the ethics of the face-to-face. -face. There's so many uh, implications in that direction. So I wonder if there's any thinking going into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely. So, I think there there are two things that I also wanted to make sure that they don't um, that people didn't get the perception that, that that it was our intent. So we have no intent to tear down all the walls of the existing universities or get rid of the universities. Uh, we, many of us went to university. It was a great experience for many different reasons. I think one key one that is often underestimated or not uh, at least mentioned or communicated enough is just the socialization aspect of spending like leaving your family, spending four years in a cohort of people in the same age. I think that is a hugely important aspect that almost no one talks about these days. It's all about innovation and, and you know, the, uh, those things. So we have no intention to get rid of the university. And we have no intention to get rid of or have kind of low appreciation of the role of the great professor. Right, the, the, the person that can hold a conversation over an entire three months period, that can get people's, like set uh, uh, learners' minds on fire. Uh, like those individuals <coughs> are fantastic and uh, we appreciate them just as much as I think everyone here. Um, the, 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 I guess the point we're trying to make is just, that is just a tiny slice of learning that happens and the, the kind of learning that people have access to. Right? I mean, how many of these uh, uh, people have we learned uh, under? Uh, how, how many people can really spend four years to go to an institution like UC Irvine? Uh, you know, just the, the capital investment. So there's all this other learning that's out there that, that I think is, is valuable and maybe as valuable as what happens in the university. So I think that's more the Pitt University story. But, um, to come back to your question about are we worried about a certain thing. So I'm not worried at all about the capitalist uh, concerns here because it's the project is set up in a way that it, the community <coughs> will always have ownership of it. So I mean, maybe there is a way to undermine it, which I'm not aware of, but there's certainly no built-in backdoor for the people who are involved to kind of appropriate it in any way. Like there, I, I am not aware of any possibility for me to even do that. Um, so I'm not worried about the capitalist uh, kind of influence on, on what's going on. I am worried about the capitalist influence of the job market, right? That there will be more demand for courses that are job uh, skills and people will get jobs and, and less demand for courses uh, that are um, 
kind of not so aligned with the job market. But the, that your comment actually <coughs> gave, me, gave me a lot of hope because the cyberpunk course is the perfect example of a course that has very little relevance, or at least in direct terms, to the to, to the job market. Uh, but it's a fantastic course, and so the fact that we have those courses and hopefully we'll have many more of them, I think is is great. And I would almost argue that it's easier to have a course like that in PHP University than at UC Irvine, uh, where there you have committees that approve, and so you know maybe there's more room for that kind of uh, positive experimentation in terms of content. What really worries me is that people come and use uh, PHP University to promote certain uh, extremist points of views. Right? So, um, and we don't have great mechanisms to defend against that right now. Um, so, uh, I, I, so I can imagine a valuable course on any topic, right? As long as it looks at all the different perspectives and it is a, a kind of tries to really understand what are the important questions and, and tries to get at them and understand all the different facets of it. And and um, but the the reality is that there are many topics where uh, the unless the course is really well done, it's a danger. It's a would be. Um, a harmful topic, I would say. And we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's the language we could use to say this course is in and this course is out. And we haven't found it. The best we found at this point is if one course would discredit uh, all the other courses. So if one course, whatever the content of that course is, would bring down all the others, we reserve the right to, to not run it right now. Uh, but I. But the reason why we're struggling with this, I think to some degree, is that the community is still too small. So to have this kind of filtering and community review, you just need many more people. Um, in the same way that Wikipedia, uh, you know, their quality control is very good because they have thousands of people reading every change that comes through the pipeline. And it's very easy to detect a, a bad change and to revert it. Whereas for us, we don't have thousands of people who, who review all the courses. So I am really worried about people trying to undermine the whole project by running a course that denies the Holocaust, for example. There's a, there's a distinction to be made, I think, between the disposition of inquiry and the disposition of propagation. Yes. And, and if one can find mechanisms for pushing a disposition of inquiry and for um, undermining or refusing a disposition of propagation um, as its principal modality. I just want to point uh, out yeah, okay. point out one thing that Philip mentioned that he was having trouble finding institutional sponsors, particularly higher education institutional sponsors, of the funding for a peer-to-peer -peer university. And we we were able to use Hewlett funding to support uh, P2PU uh, with Hewlett as a write-in. Uh, Hewlett speci specified they wanted to use it that way, but there there was a several issues that we had to get cleared up and. One of them was not only the, the really bad course or the course that taught something not very good, but the notion of, okay, it's perfectly, it's probably logical maybe on current period of period to have a course on astrology or how to read the racing form or something like that, which is not something a university wants to be associated with. Uh, but we, we felt that because of the structure and how it was a separate organization and so forth that we were we were insulated enough from from that kind from that kind of criticism that that uh, we were okay. But it goes back to what Professor Maurer said about okay, what what is a university? We got a university in our title. <coughs> Peer to peer has a university in their title. Are, are, is there some sort of crossover sort of verification or or credibility that we're lending by our association in some way? But as I say, we we were able to work that out with our folks. The way things are going, we might need the racing form sooner than we have it. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's better than betting on state funding. I'd it. So one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about validation. Because it, it seems to me that uh, you know one of the uh, inspirations of this new kind of university is to teach and learn uh, something that works even if it's not validated. Uh, in contrast to uh, uh, getting a validation for things that don't even work. You know, like, like your example about learning computer science, you get a degree for it, and then you, know, you can't put it to work. Right? Uh, the, um, so it seems that, I mean, the university 
uh, you know, the, the formal university uh, has many functions, but one of its main functions, it seems, is to validate, uh, to give a validation for certain kinds of knowledge, which is good. Now, the question I want to raise is um, uh, whether you, you know, this idea of, uh, of a peer to, uh, peer to peer you, uh, can it do without a, a notion of validation? I know you get back to it. I mean, it, it's something that's very important uh, in, in your presentation. But that seems to me to, to be, uh, uh, um, and this is a question, to be slightly contradictory. Because uh, the whole point of, the, of a peer to peer university is to teach what works. Uh, even though it's not validated, it's like you know, it's like for example the um, the relationship of museums or of biennials uh, to the to the artwork that that's being produced. I mean, one of the functions of a museum, you know, there are great artworks in museums, right? But one of its functions is that it validates whatever it's it's put into it, right? But um, but if what is new about your idea of a of a P2P university is to focus on that which are quality in, in a sense. Right? So it's it's not like giving up quality control. I mean you, you, you have to sort of uh, 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 keep at that. But quality control is not the same as validation. So um, what I'm asking is could you take a stance? Like say, you know, we are not going to give any validation. No badges, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you do this, but it, uh, because it's based on these very different uh, principles of, of teaching and learning. Because otherwise, I think the confusion and, uh, would, would set it. You know, I mean, the question is, <coughs> in what way is this university different from another university? Yeah, that's why I think the question about why you call it a university. Um, so, um, I think that I would like to tie the notion of validation to community. The, 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 or I think it, it's always tied to a community. Right? So, like, so, some community de determines uh, what are its uh, accepted practices and behaviors and, and, and what it uh, values, and then it has some mechanism of validating actions or works that are that conform or don't conform. It will be a bet. Look, it the could be a bet. It could be. I mean, it could be. A, you know, like the if someone learns to be a carpenter, yeah. the you know that they, yeah. they they could get a badge, but it, it's based on the behaviors that carpenters are supposed to display and the skills that they're supposed to have. But the carpenter community knows exactly what that means. Now, the thing is, I think where the P2P is different from, from other institutions, and I think the, the question with in, institution versus community comes in is that uh, institutions tend to uh, create structures where those things that are valid are much more fixed, whereas in communities, I would argue they are more in flux. And so we would, I, th I, I don't have a problem with validation. It, I just think that the process of, um, Determining what is valid needs to be open, and I, I don't think the process is open enough right now in many institutional educational settings. Where <coughs> just, the web de web development is an uncontroversial example because it simply moves too slowly. The process of validating uh, is just not uh, adequate for the technology it's trying to validate. In the humanities, I don't I'm not so familiar, but I'm sure there are some issues around determining what is valid and what is not. Uh, where uh, structural um, uh, processes get in the way of the communi of communities, uh, kind of there's, there must be some tension somewhere. Um, so I think, as a project peer to peer university, the only things we could validate is uh, behavior that conforms with peer learning. And so we could validate that you are a good peer learner. You collaborate with others, you share knowledge, you reflect on other people's contributions. Those are things we could validate. We can't validate uh, skills or competencies in certain topic areas because we, we are not, that's not our, we're not that community. So what we're trying to do is we work with other communities, so with Mozilla. The web developer community can validate web developer knowledge and behavior. And we are just a conduit into that community. Uh, and I think that's a mechanism that that can 
is interesting uh, for us. Uh, and it, it kind of deals with that tension that you described, uh, where you don't want to fall in the, in the old trap uh, of fixing everything and, and kind of having these rigid rules. But at the same time, there is also demand for valid, some form of validation. I think it can be part of learning as well. I mean, like the, to get feedback on, you know, are you progressing in a certain direction that the, that community has determined is is the the valid direction? I guess. Um, does that is that does that make sense? Makes sense. You're gonna yes. come, yeah. yeah. So you're gonna come back. At, I know. Um, three quick things. To, I'm Tom Melstor from the Anthropology Department. Thanks for that. Three quick things. Um, or things I think it'd be important to respond to. It, it's awesome that it's Creative Commons license and it's nonprofit and that protects you. But right now in, this, in Wisconsin, they're talking about a 50% defunding of the universities. We're talking about huge defunding of the university system here in California and elsewhere. And the right wing forces who are behind that, in many ways, I could see them loving to get access to your PowerPoint. But you talk about the system is fundamentally broken, and there's an iron triangle, and there's these pictures of the sad students sitting alone in the lecture room rather than some lonely person in the basement with their computer. And is there a way that you could reframe this that doesn't have to be so antagonistic to the university system, particularly because you're using the term at precisely this moment when the university system is under such attack? Even though I don't think it's your intention, I think this is completely co-optable by the right as an idea that the university system is broken, there's an iron triangle, what do you do with iron? Even with that metaphor, you melt it, right? You can't reshape it. Um, so you must melt the triangle and remelt it into this peer-to-peer -peer thing that's going to save us a lot of money at the same time and get rid of all these pesky unions and, and these faculty and do all that. And I know that's not your intention, but just having Creative Commons and being nonprofit does not insulate you from that problem because it's in the way that you're framing it as antagonistic to the university form. And universities are messed up, I know that for sure. But can there be ways that this could be seen as part of strengthening universities, which I think is your intention? And to build on that, it's striking that in this whole conversation, there's not one word, not one word about research. So that university is completely conflated with teaching. And I think this is on scholarship with content. And so one thing I think it's interesting to think about is that the value of universities isn't just about teaching. There are spaces of research where new ideas and concepts and things are created that then you can teach people about. And it might not be the part of, of a kind of peer-to-peer -peer thing to do that work, but the conflation of the university with learning, I think, is problematic because there's also research and actually service. And peer-to-peer -peer stuff could be awesome for service and community engagement. But the research piece, I think, I would love to see more on. And then the last point to build up to this, I do research in Second Life on virtual worlds. I think virtual stuff is awesome. But I think there's a real confusion in the way that you frame stuff about the peer-to-peer -peer thing as a mode of pedagogy versus something linked to the internet. Because a lot of what you're talking about, you could, as an experiment, do totally in neat space, right? It wouldn't have to be online or at all. And then you could have online stuff that's totally hierarchical and uses the standard or whatever, and you know this already. But, but in terms of the framing, and perhaps as a way to do a kind of rhetorical framing of the project that isn't so hostile towards the university system, to, to disaggregate a bit which aspects of this are cyber-specific versus which aspects of this link to broader conversations about sort of rethinking pedagogy more generally, because at points in your presentation I got confused between those two. Obviously, you're absolutely right that we would have no intention of being co-opted by the right that's trying to shut down the universities. Um, but I am... And I'll, 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 I'd be interested to think more about how we can reframe the message in a way that uh, avo avoids that danger. But I also do uh, struggle, I think, to, to some degree with that because some things are fundamentally broken. And one has to be able to say, and I think the, the cost of content, for example, is completely broken. Like the amount of money that people pay for textbooks, especially in the US, makes absolutely no sense when we've already paid for that with, with taxes and you know, over and over again. Uh, uh, the same with research output. So to kind of tiptoe around that, I, I think also defeats the purpose of, of really wanting to change it, right? So I'd love to find a better balance between the two. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, as I said before, I, I don't want to get rid of the university. And I think the, especially things that are not market related should get public funding in the universities. Uh, but um, I guess the, the the things we are seeing as opportunities would play into that into those arguments to some degree. Um, 
research, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, we're not, uh, I guess it comes back to this branding uh, thing that you call it a university, you create certain expectations. We, we don't do research, uh, and research is a f crucial and fundamental uh, role of the university. Some <coughs> universities do more of it than others. Uh, we do none. Um, so, I don't know, I guess I, the, the, for me the, the idea of the university maybe is a little more about a community of people who are just interested in sharing knowledge. Uh, and not so tied to a, a particular, and I mean, I guess I would like also to come back to, to some of the comments earlier. I mean, there are different ways of reading the history of the university, right? Uh, th there is the kind of uh, the safe space where we can think about everything ideal, which I would argue in most cases uh, it was much more, I mean, the Humboldt University is the perfect example. It was designed to create a common culture that could then be exported back into the regions of Germany to hold the nation together. So it was the exact opposite of trying to you know, encourage wide, wide thinking and <coughs> freedom. And yet we still refer to the Humboldt University often as kind of the, the, uh, one of the founding ideas of the university. Same with the religious uh, history of the universities in the UK, where you know, it's the exact opposite of, of free thinking. So, um, I mean, I, I think that the, the ideal of the university is that we probably share uh, isn't so closely connected to the reality either. And so I guess I want to defend peer-to-peer -peer university a little bit in that sense that, yeah, we also don't really totally fit with that ideal, but maybe we, we don't fit in other ways. Um, and the technology link, so that's a little surprising to me. I think that there is something fundamentally different about technology. You're absolutely right that peer learning has nothing to do with technology per se. Like we, this, this is peer learning. In some, in some ways. But there is something new about technology yeah. in that it has kind of break, broken down these barriers <clears throat> and also let us create these, these new forms of co collectives and collaboratives that we couldn't do before. Um, and it's just much easier to do that and, and we're kind of seeing it at a scale that, that it wasn't possible before. So I think for us it's important, maybe we should, re so I guess the, the point I'm, I'm really taking very seriously from your comments is we do need to go back and look at the messaging and communication very carefully, uh, because we are playing into kind of d different potential, uh, I would argue, misunderstandings, but you know, that, that would, you know, who cares if it's a misunderstanding? Someone takes the idea and, and, and runs with it, um, and, and that, it, the, the, that, that could potentially be dangerous. So uh, thank you very much for those comments. I, I relate to a lot of these anxieties that I'm hearing today because I, I'm actually going to teach my first online course this summer. And uh, I teach composition, and a friend of mine who teaches uh, ethics is also going to be teaching online. And both of these are not content courses. It's not like math or geography or something like that necessarily. And so the actual dramaturgical as aspect, the performative aspect in the classroom matters a lot. And, and I think just based on the last question, the idea of production and dissemination of knowledge, which is often what considered the university, we're getting rid of the production and just disseminating knowledge. And last night, my friend and I were talking about this, we say, well, you know, is just giving away information in and of itself a value? Is that is there is that a quantifiable value that we could, we could think of as being great, you know, and worthwhile, you know, just to give it out there, or or is the interaction with with the student um, more important to make sure that they get the knowledge in a, in a particularly appropriate or usable way? And I and I don't know. I don't have. I don't. I don't know where I fall on this. And I, and I think this is a really great conversation. I don't. I don't have an answer. I'm not even sure I have a question. As much as a, a voice and an anxiety that I feel is prevalent in this room. Uh, certainly amongst the anthropologists, uh, the humanities, you know, uh, because we don't teach content courses and we need that interaction. Um, but at the same time, I agree, uh, as, as a graduate student who's been in the university system, as a, not as an educator, but as a student for, for quite a while now, that there is something broken here and it's not getting fixed. In fact, if you ask most of my colleagues, we think it's getting worse. Um, we don't see this, this as a sustainable model for, the, for academia. Um, and we don't think it's going to last. Uh, most of my friends are terrified about going to the job market because we just don't even know what sort of job market exists. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about your project because I'm terrified about what's going on with this, this world here. Uh, the, the walls are crumbling, I think so. And, and if we don't figure out something else to do, um, we, we won't have this or that, you know, and maybe we'll only have that. We'll only have the dissemination of knowledge by a few people, and I think that's problematic too. And 
I guess, I guess I'm just scared. <laughs> I guess I'm just really scared of, of this or that, you know, and, and I think that it, it, it's the collapsing of the two together that, that is the only possible uh, avenue we have to look forward to, and, and it isn't one or the other. It is, it's going to be the really, you know, crafty way we bring these two models into one, right? Yeah. I actually agree with almost everything you say, um, or maybe everything, but... Um, so I think it's, uh, some things are terrible to learn online. Uh, you know, it just makes, it's, it's either impossible or makes no sense to me. And it would be great to do them face to face. I think other things are, might be better to learn online, uh, where you just need a more diverse group of people that you can interact with in, in different ways. Um, so I, as you say, you know, it's, it's not one or the other. Um, with respect to the distinction between content and learning, uh, the, for me the content is just infrastructure. Like giving away content is, is meaningless, but the thing is that the, we, the cost of giving it away is so low uh, that, you know, it, it will be, we, basically it's like, it's like oxygen. Like, is there any value in oxygen per se? No, but when you breathe, you know, it becomes very valuable to you. It's the same with content for me. So content is just that stuff that's, that you need to be able to learn. And, but then the learning is the interaction between people. Uh, and and that's, I think that's why it's called peer-to-peer -peer also, right? It's like, it's not the content university, it's the peer-to-peer -peer university. And the ideal would be that it, you learn through discourse and debate and engaging and being exposed to other ideas. I think that is the, I mean, for me, that has been the most valuable to learn, way to learn for myself. I, I wish that more people have access to that kind of experience. Um, but, yeah, I think that's <laughs> my <laughs> reply. Can you talk about um, your relationship to other open courseware initiatives? Is there tensions between you? Are you working, collaborating with them? Or what's, what's happening in that front? Um, not really any tension. I mean, there's, uh, so we leverage everything that the open courseware movement does. I mean, I, I'm actually, I guess I should, I, I sit on the board of the Open Courseware Consortium. So the, that group of institutions has published, uh, the numbers <laughs> kind of vary occasionally, but I think somewhere around 12,000 courses. So I've been, uh, like that's, that's where I came from. Like I've been very strongly promoting universities to, to basically give their content away because I didn't think it, the content had the, was the value of the university. So we leveraged that, those materials, and there's no, conflict at all. I think, it, actually the contrary, I don't think we've figured out a way, uh, a good enough way to support the Open Courseware project yet. Um, so I think they're totally open to more collaboration and we haven't really figured out how to do that well. Um, with other open education uh, projects that are not content focused, that are learning focused, so we, there are lots of projects that are looking a little bit similar to PHP University with like slightly different uh, flavors and, and variations and I think some uh, more offline, for example, which are really interesting. The the um, the one that started at the university here in California. I think it's the new school or something. Where you basically yeah, is it the new school? school? Yeah. yeah. You, you submit. You say I want to learn this. They find other people, and uh, you, but you do it face to face. So I think that's awesome. Um, and then there are a few other online ones that are a little bit similar. So no, I mean, on one hand, I think the space is so big right now, and also no one really knows what what's the best way to do it that uh, it's more collaborative than uh, competitive. Um, and what I have noticed is that almost all the other projects, like Udemy and uh, Super Cool School um, and Edufire, that they're all for profit. And so it's interesting, for, it'll be interesting for me to see, I mean, I think they, for them, they're definitely going after the same kind of money and they're competing for customers. We are kind of pretending that we don't have to do that right now. Um, and we'll see what happens, but I mean, I think, I mean, it's, I kind of feel torn about this because I want the project to succeed and do well and grow and be around 10 years from now. But when we started it, we very made it very clear that one of the successes would be that we spectacularly fail, but someone else learns from our failure and does it much better, that that would be, we would define that as success. And so I still feel that way. But at the same time, obviously, I take grant money and I, you know, I try to make, I make promises. I say we're going to grow and we're going to do all these things. And then failure doesn't feel good. 
uh, in that context. But um, so you want it both ways, right? <laughs> we want it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, just just as an illustration to your comment, the walls are, are tumbling down. When I go to sit in on lectures here, I sit in the back, and half the students have their laptops open. Uh, some of them never glance up to the entire lecture to see what, what's being visually shown. But, and, and some, of course, are social networking. But, um, but I think a lot of the other ones are actually looking. They're no longer confined by the walls. They're, they're using uh, the web and they're outside the walls, and they're looking up either what they're interested in or while you were lecturing, lecturing here, I looked up your course catalog, and I looked up the MIT course catalog on the web, uh, just to see what these things were doing. Um, but um, the conventional lecturers here, uh, you know, it's somewhere, they have, the, it, it's not organ, no one knows how to comprehend what's going on. But, and, and the students eventually are voting with their minds as to what sources they want to use. And, and finding anything on the web is very disorganized. It, you never get it at the right level. You never get it organized, integrated, prepared, which is the way we evaluate our, our teaching here for those criteria. Um, so it, it's somehow a compromise between these two has to be found. So the students can use web material, but they also have to use the organized integrated uh, outlook that the instructor brings to the course. Yeah. Um, two thoughts on this one. And one connects back to a, a thought you raised earlier. Um, it's kind of the connection between the, the open and the closed and how do we um, make that work for both. We actually had one course that was taught at a um, university in uh, Japan, Keio University, on journalism, digital journalism. And it was open to peer-to-peer -peer university learners. And um, I've looked around at other people who've done similar things, and the overwhelming response of those experiments has been that they improve the experience for everyone involved. The professor, because there's there are more people that are active and kind of bring diverse ideas. The, the students in the institution, because they get feedback from, kind of, they perform at a, uh, so I guess th there is that safe space question, which we I didn't, have had time to come back to tonight. It's, it's, it, it's really interesting. But it's like they perform on a much bigger stage, right? So they get kind of the, it's different. You write a blog post, the whole world can read it. Or you write it in Blackboard, and only you or seven people in the class can read it. You, you, and then you get a response from someone. Like it's an amazing experience, right? So for the students in the institution, I think it's beneficial. Obviously, for the peer to peer university, it's great, because they get access to a university course for free. Um, and the interesting thing in that course was the best work was done not by KO University students, but by P2PU students. Um, because they were just, I think, my interpretation is they were so motivated to kind of show that they can also do it. Uh, and the university students were, like, they had to do all these other courses, and they needed to hit whatever, how, you know, they needed the marks. And so I think there's, there's some integration, actually, at the learner level that makes sense for, for both. And at the structure and experience and curation level, I, I'm really interested in the notion that the, the kind of the, the great teacher asks the right questions rather than helps with the right answers. And, and so we, we're trying to find kind of in, in the courses, we're trying to encourage people to design questions but then let the community figure out the answers themselves because I think it's the key, it's the big questions that you only know once you have looked at something from all the different sides and you've had time to kind of go back at it and reflect and like, you know what are the, the big questions. You might never know the answers, right? But you'll, like, you, you've, you're discovering the questions uh, as you uh, gain expertise. At least that's kind of this notion that I'm playing with in my head right now. So I, I would love, and I think the structure argument works at the question level. Um, in both worlds very comfortably, or it spans both worlds. It doesn't really work if the, if the curation comes at the answer level and like, you, you help people more through that course, which might be necessary in some uh, instances, or I'm sure it's necessary in some instances. But that doesn't, that, I think that works better in the, um, 
the more structured environments.